Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Richard Trask. I'm here from the Access Group, which is a uh, science and engineering group at the University of Bristol. And my presentation this morning is sort of the meeting between science, engineering and innovation. Firstly, just wanted to explain a little bit about who we are, the research that we do, and then I've concentrated on sort of uh, a number of topics this morning to talk you through. Um, and then I was going to detail a little bit about their potential uses, their benefits, and then just a few concluding remarks from our perspective. Um, as I said, I, I work in the Advanced Composite Centre for Innovation and Science. This is based, uh, Faculty of Engineering um, has direct links into faculties of science, so chemistry and physics, um, and also biology. Um, our, our mission, or our, our vision, is to be a world-leading centre for composite materials. So a composite material, um, in the way that we use it, is a material which starts in two phases, so a fibre, that could be the, well, it is the reinforcement agent, and then also a matrix material, which then combines the fibres. So we have lots of uh, research going on from members of staff, uh, researchers like myself, and also PhD students. We have four themes. I reside within the multifunctional group um, at the top, um, and I can explain a little bit more in detail about what we do. Uh, the other three groups, uh, we have the design analysis and failure group. I'm not going to really discuss much about this group today. Um, the intelligent structures, so typically morphing structures. I, come, I reside within an aerospace department, so a morphing aeroplane is something that we sort of aspire towards. Um, and then lastly, the fourth group is the actual processing and characterization. And obviously, for a, as an engineer, we need to be able to make these things, and we need to be able to understand them, and we need to be able to sort of input this back into the other themes. So we have a lot of effort in here, actually feeds back in into these the other three. First things first, the multifunctional composites group. Typically, we split across a number of different ideas. Um, I reside within the self-healing group. I'm looking at making uh, an engineering structure behave like a human body in terms of an, an impact event. I want it to be able to heal and to restore its performance in the same way that you and I heal after we cut ourselves or typically as we break our bones. Colleagues are looking at doing, uh, introducing other functionality. So when I say functionality, composite materials, this, this idea of a composite material that it can be stacked, it can be assembled, it can be woven into a, into a structure, we can actually introduce things at various points along the processing. And by doing that, we can then give it another capability that it didn't typically have before. We're also looking at how, for example, nature... Nature doesn't have a discrete sort of interface. If you take a cellular structure like a wood or something like that, there's a hierarchy of materials across an interface. Us and composites, we appreciate that it's the separation of the interfaces that are sort of driving the design criteria of our materials. And if we can actually blend this interface, then maybe we can start to recover and exploit these materials to greater performance than they already are. Oxetic materials is a, is a relatively new material in terms of... Uh, the material, material science environment. It's a material that if you can stretch in one direction and it will actually do the opposite in the other direction. And obviously we also have to consider how we model these structures as well. So that's the first group. Uh, the second group, obviously, analysis and failure. We have to accept these structures go into service. We have to understand the failure. By understanding the failure, we can feed it back into the analysis. By doing better analysis, we can make better structures. So this group is aimed at trying to find optimization is understanding the failure mechanisms, and then we can feed this back into critical environments, so vibration, fatigue, and also understanding how uh, composites behave in an impact environment. Intelligent structures, uh, a growth area across Europe, uh, something that we're very active in at Bristol. We need to try and make, you know, this is an idealised morphing structure. Um, obviously, we see how birds fly. Maybe we're aspiring towards that. But at the moment, on a materials level and on a structures level, we have to try and do different things. If you look at how we could do it with composites, well, composites can have can be bistable. This is a, a simple composite laminate. Uh, it's, as you can see, but we can flex it into another state. So you can actually trigger a shape form. Maybe I could ask you to just have a look. 
So then we just take a simple material like that and try and deflect it, but perhaps we want it to move into more of an aerofoil section. And then we could start to think about trailing edges or flaps on vehicles in an aerospace environment. Other, other areas that could work in as well. Composite processing, I'll, I'll delve into a little bit more about that in a minute as well. But we have to understand what we're doing. I mean, typically, we're starting with fibres. Fibres, we can look across to the textile industry. If we look across at the textile industry, then they're more inventive than what we're currently doing with our flat laminates and composites. So there's lots of things that we can learn across from that industry and apply it into our own. Of course, oops, we also need to think about how we're going to recycle it. So again, that's an area of uh, activity at Bristol. So this is my area, uh, self-healing. First thing to understand is this is, a, this is a composite. This is a composite that's at the end of its life. Um, you can see the fibre orientation within it. Uh, we've got fibres running in this direction, fibres going across, and that's typically it's failed. It's completely had it. How failure occurs is often through the, um, the environment, the operational loads, and how we've designed it to start with. But we've got to start looking at stress concentrations and the implication of these singularities on how defects initiate and form. So what do I want to do? Well, I make self-healing materials. I have them at different length scales. Again, some more samples for you to look at if you wish. I want to try and understand how nature does it, how we do it, how animals do it how we go about healing wounds, how we have branch vascular networks, how this network can transport a fluid around the structure. It can then wait for that damage event, and upon that damage event, it leaks. It shows a bruise, ideally, because as engineers, we'd like to know that it's been damaged. We'd like to know that something's occurred, and therefore we can assume that something is actually being repaired. And then the structure continues um, through the rest of its operational life. We have these wonderful branch networks, but if you look across at the plant systems, then yes, they have branch networks, but they have single paths as well. And plants are a lot better. They have more redundancy than you and I do. Our redundancy sort of resides in our brain and also uh, behind our knees, which I'm not too sure about. But getting blood flow to the brain, there is actually two paths. In plants, it's much the same. You could take an axe to a tree, as an example. I'm not saying I'm suggesting that you should, but if you take an axe to a tree... And as long as you don't do a complete circle all the way around the outside, the tree will live. So in terms of 360 degrees, if you cut through 340 degrees of the outside bark, the tree will survive because it does have these redundancy pathways. So as an engineer, I like that idea. I like the idea that I could have something that can heal and can heal continuously through the life of the structure. But of course, I'm not just worried about healing. That's... that's uh, a slide showing healing in process in a comp healing ongoing in a composite material. That's under an impact event and then it just bleeds out. So what you're seeing is it's under UV light. So we make these in the labs. We can introduce the veins and the arteries that you and I have in our body and we can put them into a structure. So we can have them for healing. But typically, what happens if we want to do thermal management? So we're looking at sort of things in space structure. Equally, how, how about sort of structural tuning or could we use it as a um, hydraulic power We've seen these deployable structures that are in the space environment. And then equally, we've embedded all these things within it. We can start to play other tunes as well. Try and fully exploit the idea of putting a network within a structure. So why do it? That's the question I'm always asked. Why, why should I come and use your self-healing materials? Why should I do it? Well, typically, we can get strength reduction or restoration back up to 80% of the baseline. So you have an impact event. It's a sizable impact event. It's not a small impact event. Then it will typically degrade the structure to about 50%. And we can go from 50% back up to 80%. Okay, it's not 100%. It's not quite like you and I. But then you and I have scab tissue and things like that that affect the ability or our ability afterwards. <coughs> but if we can get to 80% and we can encourage the designers to look at this and apply this, then we could start making self-healing composite structures. <coughs> 